Professor Foscarinas, it's a pleasure to have you on our program. Thank you for taking the time for this conversation with me. I'm glad to be here, of course. For how long has homelessness been an issue in our country? So the present crisis of homelessness, mass homelessness as we know it today, really launched in the 1980s, the early to mid 1980s is when it exploded. That's not the first time that homelessness has appeared, however, on a mass scale. I would say the first time was during the Great Depression mm -hmm. and in the 1930s. That's a period of time when millions of Americans lost their homes and were literally out on the street. And there were shanty towns and later called Hoovervilles. Yeah, yeah. So that, that was a time of mass homelessness. That um, eventually that um, was alleviated, that receded, and the country entered a different phase. And it really did not, we really did not see mass homelessness again until the early to mid 80s, as I said. So that is really when the crisis started. And I think that's a very important point to make because people today, especially younger people, see, often assume homelessness has always been part of the United States. Yeah, um, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Context. And it has not. It has not. There was a time when, you know, there were people who were homeless before this, um, what I'm calling an explosion in the 80s, but there were limited, you know, there were skid rows in major downtown areas of big cities. Um, those primarily people living there were primarily single men, often with a drinking problem, primarily white single men. Um, but that was a very limited and different kind of population than what we're seeing now and what we started seeing in the 80s. It's so, not to, I'm sorry. No, I'm just wondering, you said that uh, the, the homelessness, the mass homelessness of the Great Depression, that spike, we had an economic calamity in the 1930s. Exactly. When was that alleviated? By the 1940s after during World War II and after? Is am I guessing this correctly? It was sort of alleviated. Yes. Well, the first thing was um, President Roosevelt and his New Deal. The New Deal was a direct response to the economic suffering that people were experiencing at the time, including homelessness. So the New Deal launched a series of social um, support programs, including the beginnings of housing programs. That's the time when the country first saw the development of housing assistance for people who um, needed it. And so that FDR launched nationwide national programs. Yes, national programs. I see known as the New Deal. That's what FDR called it. It was the New Deal. And it was a response to the extreme crisis that was brought by the Great Depression. And that's when a lot of these social programs started. Did, part did, of the, New Deal. did the national programs work? Did we see their positive impact? Uh, or was it World War II that well, solved this crisis? Yes. I mean, I think that the that World War II also played a role because, you know, the war economy um, put created, um, I guess, ginned up the economy. I'm yeah. no economist, but I, my understanding is that there were two things. There were the, the New Deal programs and there was also World War II. And that alleviated the crisis and the, that held steady for some decades after that. So we get into the 1970s and the 1980s, based on what you're saying, mass homelessness begins to pick up. And I guess what I'm trying to figure out, you see this perspective of someone who is not uh, 
an expert such as yourself in this in this specific um, area, they look at the Great Depression, it's this big calamity, and then we don't have another one. I mean, the 1970s were bad, then we had the Great Recession. What I'm wondering is, uh, how how does homelessness now compare to the past? Is it at, at its worst point? Um, I, I, I guess I can say without trying to um, project exactitude, but mm -hmm. it's probably at the worst point since the Great Depression. Oh, wow. So I think that's a way to think about it, that Great Depression is a big calamity. Now it's, again, a big calamity. Um, and I should say it's not just so that we have homelessness, but there's also the sort of people who are a much bigger group of people who are at risk of homelessness, who are precariously housed, who are paying a very disproportionate share of their income for housing, and who are thus at pretty imminent risk of losing that housing. They're kind of like a of, paycheck away from homelessness. Is exactly, exactly. Okay. Or people who, by some definitions, now definition of homelessness is a whole big controversial topic, but some, you know, and there are different ways of defining it. One way of defining it is people who are either on the street, living in a public place, um, the people you tend to notice, the, the sort of what conjures up the stereotypical image of a homeless person, someone living on the street, uh, maybe suffering from a mental health crisis or problem. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a lot of people who don't fit that stereotype, first of all, who may be living in public and going to a job who don't stand out, who you might pass on the street and not realize that they're homeless, or they might be living in a shelter. Um, there's that kind of group of people who are either living in public or in a shelter. That's one. Isn't that crazy? They have a job, they're willing and able, but they still cannot afford to live. Yes. Or they're living in their car. This is probably the fastest growing group of people living in their cars and they lost their home, they still have their car, so they're living in their car. Many of them are working. There was just today's New York Times, an art, uh, yesterday's New York Times, an article about this growing group of people. Um, and it's, you know, these people are also homeless. They have lost their home and they're living in their car. And similarly, there are people, this larger group of people who, is doubled up, they've lost their home, they've been evicted, they've moved in with friends or family, and they're sleeping on someone's couch, sleeping on someone's floor, moving from place to place, lacking a stable place of their own. They're doing this because of economic necessity, not because they like living with their family or their friends, but because there's no other choice. So that, by some definitions, those people are also homeless so now i've sent us completely off track but... no, no you haven't you know you, you you're talking about fastest growing group of people that are becoming homeless these are people that actually are working i'm wondering what does data tell us about this progression of homelessness this sort of growing mass of homelessness from the 1970s to now do we have data that shows the, like, like an accelerating rate of homelessness? Do we have numbers for now? So numbers are, um, and I want to get back to the 70s also, because okay. I, I, I want to emphasize that the real, so what happened, let me just talk about the 70s for a moment. Please do. So the 70s see gentrification really picking up. Gentrification, by that I mean, um, neighborhoods developing in a way that displaces people. So inexpensive housing being torn down in favor of more expensive housing. And we see this primarily with what um, are called single room occupancy units. I don't know if that's a familiar term, SROs. 
these used to be prevalent in big cities primarily. So inexpensive accommodations, you know, you have a room with a shared kitchen, a shared bathroom. Um, so it's a, it's a, a cheap kind of place to live, but it served a purpose for many people who could not afford anything more. These started to be torn down in the 70s and um, in favor of, by developers in favor of more lucrative forms of housing. So that's what happened in the 70s and the 80s um, with the advent of the Reagan administration and the mission that administration's mission to shrink the footprint of the federal government. That was a stated goal of the um, Reagan uh, presidency. And many of these social programs launched initially during F the FDR era were cut. And housing in particular took a very big hit. So that's um, why I zero in on the early 80s, early to mid 80s for this dramatic increase. Now you're asking about numbers. Yeah, I don't, I don't have good numbers. No one has good numbers on homelessness. Why is that? It's hard to measure. Um, it's difficult to, um, it, it's difficult to measure a population that doesn't have a home. Most of our data collection, of the country's data collection me mechanisms, like the census, for example, depend on an address. Yeah, you go and so, knock on doors, literally. Yeah. Right, exactly. Or you put something in the mail. Uh -huh. But people who are homeless don't have a door. They don't have an address or a mailbox, generally. So... The standard methods are not going to work. There are ways to measure, um, and and there have there are people experts who have estimated based on those other ways. But the official ways, the the government counts homeless people, and there is an official way. The Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development requires communities, cities mainly, that receive federal dollars from HUD, Department of Housing and Urban Development, they must um, carry out a count each year as a condition of receiving funding. They have to carry out a count of their homeless populations. And this these counts usually get a lot of publicity. You may have heard about them. Your listeners may have heard about them. They're often kind of publicized in communities. They sometimes attract a lot of volunteers and they're a good way to engage people, um, but they're not- they, they make it to the news. For example, the number of homelessness in Los Angeles is skyrocketing, that sort of thing, right? Right, right exactly. And undoubtedly it is, but these counts are very inexact measures. So what the counts do is they take a single night in January and they count people who are in shelter. That's pretty straightforward. But the, the problem problematic part is people on the street or living in public. So they recruit these volunteers, volunteers fan out and literally visually count people. And this is very hard to do. I mean, First, you're depending on people who are not trained. Um, they're very curse. They receive a ver very cursory training, and then they have to make a judgment call: Is this person homeless? Is this person not homeless? They have to cover vast parts of a city, and so necessarily, this is going to be a very, very approximate number. So that's why we don't have good, and, and they may use different methods year from year to year. So it's not even a great way to sort of get comparative information huh. to identify trends. Does this, does this create uh, issues for receiving uh, local or federal funding or donations? 
because at some point you got to say how many people I'm helping, but the number is n not, you know, for certain, right? Well, you can, you can say how many people you're, you know, if you're providing shelter beds or serving meals, you can say how many people, but you're right. I mean, you don't, it, it, it's not, there is a lack of real data that's reliable. Oh, and wow. there, are, there are ways to compensate for this and people who are experts on this kind of thing have them, but, and there are statistical ways of approximating, but they're not the official count. Um, Interesting. Um, let's take a break here uh, and then talk about how we got here and how did it okay. get so bad. Uh, Professor Foscarinas, how did homelessness become such a dire problem? And I'm wondering, almost philosophically, is did we take the wrong turn somewhere? Did we miss all the signals along the way? You know, my hometown of San Francisco has a huge homelessness problem. No one wants this, Republican, Democrat, rich, poor. What happened? Right. So I'll go back to the early 1980s, and that's really the first crisis point um, in recent times. So 1979, the federal government each year funded over 300,000 new units of low-income housing, housing affordable to very poor people. Three, over 300,000 units. I think okay. it's 147,000, something like that. 1982, that number goes down to just over 3,000. So that is an astonishing drop. Three, over 300,000 to under 3,000. And that's enormous. Wait, it's 300,000 to 3,000? So that's yes, 1%. Yes. Wow. So this is a huge cut. That This is what I, why I'm emphasizing the early to mid 80s that these and this charge, and it was not just housing. All manner of social programs were cut during the Reagan administration. And this was not just a, a misstep. This was a plan to shrink, shrink the footprint of the federal government. Payments for people with disabilities, people who are physically and mentally disabled, are normally by law entitled to disability support. These It became much harder and this was a decision this the administration made to make getting these benefits much harder. And as a result, hundreds of thousands of people were kicked off. So these are very vulnerable people at, at the, and who um, needed these benefits and were not able to get them. So th these are huge shifts that happen. And this is you mentioned philosophy. I mean, this is a shift in philosophy also. I, the, during the um, New Deal era, the idea was, you know, there's this idea of the common good. And this changes pretty dramatically to a philosophy of bootstraps. You're kind of on your own. And the administration, in fact, took the position that um, homelessness is a choice. It didn't acknowledge that this is a social problem, but rather this is a problem of individual choice. People were choosing to be on the streets. It was a lifestyle choice. It was, and it, there was no responsibility of the federal government to address this crisis. So that was the situation at that time. So here you're talking about the Reagan years. Uh, you know, 1982, it's his um, uh, second full year in office. But then Bill Clinton becomes president and uh, and uh, Barack Obama be becomes president. We have Democratic presidents who you would think are more liberal, 
Does does this philosophy shift? Not really, not fundamentally. I think ah. I think that there was a fundamental shift that happened of philosophy that was never fully reversed. So the numbers, the cuts in housing, for example, have never been restored. They've been increased. And especially now, I would say during- Cuts, uh, cuts have been increased? No, the, no, not, I'm sorry, I didn't say that correctly. The okay. funds have been, have increased, but okay. not fully restored. I not see. fully restored. So the, um, so Clinton is a good, this is, I would say this is no longer sim, a simple partisan issue. I think it started in the Reagan era, but certainly Clinton um, campaigned on a promise to end welfare as we know it, to end, this was another program started during the New Deal era, the era that Clinton campaigned on a promise to end. And he repealed this very, very minimal benefit, which um, supported poor families and ch with children and also continue this narrative of personal choice that Reagan started that, you know, we've got to give people incentive to work as if, you know, otherwise people will not be motivated. So mm. it, it was not something that was reversed. And even during, the, so during Obama, the Obama administration, another thing happened that was also a critical point, which was the Great Recession. You mentioned that earlier, and yeah. you're right, that that was also a critical point in time when people, um, it was almost uh, like, the earlier crisis point during the early Reagan years, this almost similar thing happened with a new wave of homelessness. People, uh, the foreclosure crisis, people lost their homes and some of those people became homeless and renters also um, suffered during the foreclosure crisis. People who were renting from um from people who um, who were foreclosed on became homeless. So that was another wave of homelessness during the 2000s, um, during the Obama administration. And we haven't recovered from that. It's gotten worse. Not, well, it's gotten worse. I mean, there was, you know, often what we do in these situations is there's some help and there was help during the obama administration but it was just it was like a one year shot of help that did did help people out of homelessness and prevent homelessness for some people but then that was it and yeah so it we did not recover from that it's gotten worse because in the meantime so it's not just government it's also what's happening in the private sector, the cost of housing is go is skyrocketing. So, you know, the the housing assistance that exists now. So, staying with government for a moment. So, the housing assistance that exists now is primarily um, something called vouchers. So, if you're very poor, you you are eligible to get a housing voucher from the federal federal and state government combined. This is supposed to help you go out on the market and rent a place, pay for housing. But rents are increasing. Rents are increasing. Not only are rents increasing, but you but there you're you're not you don't have a right to this. In other words, you can get this only so long as Congress is funding it. And now, and for years, Congress has not funded this sufficiently. So right now, only one in four of people who are poor enough to be eligible for this kind of help 
actually receive it. Only one in four, because there's not enough money. Ah, oh. um, so government's involvement here has not kept up with the economic conditions that essentially is a product of real estate prices just creeping right. up constantly. Exactly. Um, you said that this is not a partisan issue, and that 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 made me think. Um, you know, we see more homelessness. I'll just talk about two cities I'm familiar with, in in well, three cities at this point now: Los Angeles, New York, and San Francisco. I've spent a great deal of time in these three big cities, and they all happen to be democratically based cities. Um, so sort of what we see in popular culture seems to be different than what you're proposing that, or are there homeless people also in Republican states that we just don't talk about? Oh, absolutely. Sure. There are plenty of homeless people in Florida, for example, or in Texas. I mean, there are homeless people all over the country. They're not you know, they're not limited to Democratic or Republican states. There are homeless people everywhere. This is a national problem. This is not limited to San Francisco or New York or LA. Is it as bad, let's say, in Texas and Florida as these three big cities that I identified? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, these are issues that exist everywhere. You know, you're talking about cities that are particularly dense yeah. and have large populations in general. But there are plenty of homeless people in, and there's plenty of housing need and lack of affordable housing in these other states and cities there. Absolutely. Do, do you, you know, going back from the 1970s on, we talked about politics and Congress and funding. Now, this makes me think of us, just ordinary Americans, you and I. Do you think our attitudes as a people towards homelessness has changed? Um, I, that's a hard question to answer. Um, there are polls that have been conducted on, on public attitudes towards homelessness. Ah. And polls show that people um, are very concerned and actually people fear becoming homeless themselves. And that the polls also show that, that people think, the public thinks that the federal government should be doing more and identifies homelessness as related to housing and the lack of affordable housing. Um, so that's what polls show. I think, if anything, they're showing some increased... Um, uh some some decreased decreased support for approaches to homelessness that we call criminalizing homelessness which many cities have adopted particularly in the past you know since the 90s many cities have um, adopted laws that are intended to push homeless people out of sight, and we call those criminalization of homelessness. So uh, based on uh, public polling, it shows that people now are less in favor of that tough legal approach to homelessness. Yes. Yes, that's what the polls show. Now, you know, you can, um, polls are a funny thing, and, you know, they can, you can read them, in different ways. I mean, certainly, but I, I do think there's validity. I do think that people are increasingly understanding that homelessness is a housing problem and they're increasingly relating the housing costs, which rising housing costs, which are now affecting more and more people, ordinary people, as you, as you described it, um, are being affected by rising housing costs. And I think seeing the connection to homelessness um, increasingly. And so that, you know, that I think drives an increasing view that 
simply trying to push people out of sight or out of cities is not the way to go, that what's needed is to address the housing problem. Um, you know, since polls are in favor of um, um, doing something about um, homelessness, um, you know, whether it's funding or other programs, do you think politicians are not responsive and the right steps are not being taken because in the list of things that we need to do in our country, it just falls to, I don't know, number seven, eight, nine, ten. Is that is that the case? Um, well, I that's a hard question to answer. Um, yes, I think that it's in in terms of politicians' priorities, it's this is not a top priority. Now mm -hmm. consider what happened during COVID though. We just went through this experience of the pandemic. Yeah. And that was the time that really brought um, to the fore, I think, what it means to not have a home. You know, remember, the first thing that happened with a pandemic, stay at home, wash your hands, isolate. All of oh. those things are impossible to do if you don't have a home. If you don't have a sink, how are you going to wash your hands? If you don't have a room, how are you going to isolate? So this, I think... Um, really brought in stark relief what it means to not have a home and how important, how critical it is to have a home, to have housing. And during the time of the pandemic, there were public policies put in place that addressed the needs of homeless people specifically. And, you know, cities- Address their needs with regards to COVID? Well, yeah, well, the regards to COVID in terms of having a place to be. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the CDC recommended, strongly urged cities to put people in individual um, housing units, if at all possible. Studies, there were studies that came out that showed how vulnerable people are. Um, people who are homeless, homelessness is not good for your health, generally. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so you tend to already have all of these, you know, like high blood pressure, chronic diseases, respiratory illnesses that make you more vulnerable to um, to getting COVID, to becoming severely ill, to dying. Um, to were there, um, Professor Foscarinas, was, were there any studies uh, that showed that a larger proportion of homeless people caught COVID uh, in comparison to the general population. I bet that yeah. was the case. Yes, yes, there are. And there were actually studies that showed this, oh, wow. that homeless people were more vulnerable to getting COVID. And they were, let's see, the three to five times more likely to be hospitalized or to be in intensive care if they got it. Um, and so more likely to get it, more likely to be severely ill, more likely to be in intensive care yeah. than the general population by a lot. Um, Let's take a break here. We'll be right back to talk about laws and homelessness. Professor Vascarinas, as a country, do we deal with homelessness uh, at the local level as... We did with healthcare mandates during COVID, for example, we just talked about it. The CDC uh, you know, promulgates guidelines, but they were not necessarily mandates unless it was for sort of intercommerce uh, travel and all of that. Or do we have national laws for homelessness kind of like similar to, I guess, immigration? So we do have national laws and this um, the first major national law, first major federal law to address homelessness um, was enacted in 1987. 1987, so was, okay. Yes, at the sort of right at the time when the crisis was first um, burgeoning. And this was um, is legislation, which is still the major federal legislation addressing homelessness. It was when it was first enacted, it was meant to be an emergency response. Mm 
And I know this because I worked to get it enacted. What was and the name of that act? So it's now called the McKinney Vento Homeless Assistance Act. And it was named after two members of Congress, Stuart McKinney, a Republican, and Bruce Vento, a Democrat, who were the lead sponsors and the major forces behind it. And it was originally supposed, it was part one of what was a, a comprehensive proposal at the time. It was part one, which was the emergency part, and it remained really the only part, it was supposed to be followed by longer term solutions. Um, but the legislation as it was enacted was focused on emergency relief. So emergency shelter, uh, not solely, but primarily on emergency solutions like shelter. Um, and getting this enacted was actually a major feat because this was during the time of Reagan, who denied that this was even a problem. He certainly denied that it was not an issue for the federal government. Yeah, he started in 1982, as as, as you talked yes, about in the prior segment. Right. Yeah, But he signed it into law because it was, um, that's how it be was enacted, because it was supported by large bipartisan majorities in Congress. That's So that's the basic law. By the way, it's in here, you said you were involved in pushing this law through did you work in congress back then no no i was an advocate you were an advocate. i spent the majority of my career as an advocate i actually left a law firm job in new york to move to washington to advocate on behalf i was at the time i i took a job with it to establish a, a an office for the National Coalition for the Homeless, which was then based in New York, and to advocate for a federal response to what was clearly a growing national crisis. So homelessness emerges in the 80s as a national crisis. That seemed to suggest that a federal response was urgently needed. And so that's how I got involved in this issue as an advocate. and. Um, to persuade Congress and federal agencies that they had to do something, to building a coalition of groups around the country and people who were concerned about this to put pressure on Congress. And it seems like it was a bipartisan coalition. One, yeah. the name, even the name of the act has one Democrat, one right. Republican. Right. Okay, right. that becomes sort of the seminal law, but it's an emergency act. As, as you right. described it, yeah, okay. Right, right. So over the years, so it's a funny thing. Something has passed and then, you know, it's, it tends to be forgotten about. It gets harder then. Um, it can get harder to then um, go the next step. So what ha ended up happening is that funding increased. We were able to get funding increased for this act we were able to get it reshaped in some ways to focus more on longer term solutions, but not to really increase the funding enough to put those solutions in place. So over- That seems like it's a law without teeth really, right? Well, yeah. I mean, it has some teeth, but yes, you're absolutely right. It's a law that is grossly underfunded. So it what happened is, during, um, actually during the George W. Bush administration, um, the law shifted to focus on, to put a priority on something called Housing First. So Housing First is a programmatic strategy which says, let's not put people in emergency shelters. That doesn't solve the problem. Housing solves homelessness, not shelter. And that you can actually, there been there's been a lot of success with this model where you know someone you you can you someone is offered housing and whatever services they might need once they're in the housing are then offered as well so say somebody is mentally ill and needs mental health care or substance abuse treatment 
First, they have to have housing because these services will not be effective without them. Can't you know maintain a mental health treatment re regimen or a substance abuse treatment plan if you're on the street or in your shelter. You need a place to live. And a lot of people also don't need those treatments. They just need a place to live. So provide the housing. That's called housing first. That was- This built sounds really positive. It is very positive. Okay. However, it's not funded. This is occurring <laughs> within, I mean, this is what, and this, you know, this is within a context where we're still basically with this original legislation from 1987. Yes, the funding has increased, but not in, to the extent that is necessary, certainly not to make up for this total, um, these cutbacks that occurred going back to the 1980s. So there's, you know, as a result of the New Deal, there's a the beginnings of some programs to ensure that people have housing and that everyone can afford housing. These get hollowed out in the 80s and never get put back together. And then we have this little new law that is targeted at homeless people. And then we decide to ask it to also take on housing, but we don't provide the funding for it to do that. Uh, so I'm sorry. What, what do you mean by new law? Are, are you, you're not. You're not talking well, about. I'm, 19... I'm talking the 1987. Okay, law. that's same new thing. Law okay, yeah, yeah. Responding yeah. to this crisis. Yeah. And which is the probably predictable result of cutting all the housing funding, but it's not commensurate to the problem. So the new law. 1987 starts with shelter in the 2000, 2009, actually, it, it formalizes this commitment, which actually was first adopted in by George W. Bush, but becomes formally part of this law in, in 2009. But the funding does not increase to allow it to really solve the problem. So, you know, what do we expect right now people i just there's a um a, a study that shows that you know each year people exit homelessness but each year a greater number of people enter it so the, there are programs that get people out of homelessness but the same causes that are driving people into it are still there and they're getting worse has the U.S. Supreme Court weighed into this? No, um, not really. The so the U.S. Supreme Court. There's been quite a lot of litigation um, challenging what I called earlier the criminalization of homelessness, mm -hmm. and there have been some recent rulings at the federal appeals court level that it's excuse me, it's unconstitutional to criminally punish someone for living in public when they have no other place to be. That's so, a big case. Yes, that's not Supreme Court though. These are oh. federal federal appeals court. Oh, they're, Fed, okay. Yeah, so they're- One of in, the Fed circuits, okay. Right, in particular, the Ninth Circuit has had two major decisions in the past five years that are very strong on this point. It's cruel and unusual punishment violates the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution to make it a crime for someone to sleep on the street when they have no other place to go. Oh, wow. Is, and, this, is this going up to the Supreme Court? Well, so the first case, which was in 2018, the cities petitioned for the Supreme Court to review. The Supreme Court declined review. Now there's just there's another case that they are petitioning again the, the Supreme Court to review. I hope it does not because I am afraid of what this Supreme Court might do. But, oh, you're you're afraid that if the Supreme Court grants cert on this, it's a more conservative Supreme Court, so they may yeah. actually uphold these local uh I mean, criminalization that's what I'm afraid laws. Of. 
Yeah. I don't think that there's a reason for it to, because there's no split in the circuits, which is usually one of the, which is one of the criteria for the Supreme Court to review something. Yeah. And it's, I I don't think that the, these rulings from the Ninth Circuit are grounded in much earlier Supreme Court precedent. I don't think there's any reason for this Supreme Court to revisit that. And the earlier Supreme Court precedent was not on homelessness specifically, but it w- was on the on the more general issue of can you punish somebody, criminally punish somebody for involuntary conduct or for status? Um, maybe you've heard of this. Stat- can you punish someone for their status? No, you cannot. That's unconstitutional. You it's, mean status as being homeless? Is that what you mean? Right. Or right. And it's so not to get it too technical, but the argument here is that um, if somebody is sleeping, if somebody is homeless, the status of being and they have no other place mm-hmm. to sleep but on the street, then if you're punishing them for doing that, it's it's essentially punishing their status because they have no choice. And you can also think of it in terms of punishing something that's involuntary, that's otherwise harmless, and it's necessary to life. It's life sustaining. Everybody has to sleep. And so that's the general principle that was, um, that is based on these older Supreme Court cases that are well established. I see. Before uh, we conclude this 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 segment, I just want to make sure I have I have this correctly. 1982, Reaganomics comes in and they cut a bunch of housing. Uh, it goes from 300,000 housing units to 3,000 one percent. 1987. <laughs> It's just the situation. We have a crisis. They come out with this emergency act, bipartisan. You're involved in it uh, in, in pushing it through. And that 1987 act essentially is our national homelessness law. It gets tweaked a little bit in 2009, uh, housing first. But but that's it. That's our national federal homelessness law. Yes. Oh, wow. Uh, Let's take a break here. Stay with me and Professor Foscarinas as we get into the perspective. Professor Foscarinas, in the last three segments, we talked about the problem of homelessness. You know, we had it in the Great Depression that it picked up again in the late 1970s and got worse in the 1980s, and here we are. Um, So let's talk about solutions. Do you have any solutions for this recalcitrant problem. Yes, I do. Oh, wonderful. (laughs) So we know the solutions. I I think collectively we have the solution. Housing first has been known to work. It's evidence-based. It means it's backed up by lots of studies that show that it works. The problem is we, we we need the structure around it. So By that, I mean, we need a commitment to housing in this country. We need to start thinking of housing as a basic human right. Um, In this country now, we basically have commodified housing. What that means is that we, housing has gotten disconnected from human need. It's an investment vehicle. What the other trend, we talked about how the cost of housing is skyrocketing. Developers are building housing, um, charging as you know whatever the market will bear. There's also um, investors, institutional investors, buying housing, even building housing for profit, and it's become disconnected from people's needs. It doesn't have to be this way. Um, so Finland is an example of a country that has very nearly um, solved homelessness. It's a a smaller country by far, Mm -hmm. that's for sure, but it also has a very different approach. It invests in what it calls social housing. Mm 
So affordable housing, housing that is affordable to extremely poor people, but is not limited to very poor people. It's social housing for a variety of income levels. It's mixed income housing. Um, and it, it, it invests in this. It invests money in this. And it also has invests in other kinds of social supports. So if you're so poor that you can't even afford the social housing, there's a housing benefit that you can get that will help you pay for it. Um, so that's a model um, that is working. Um, and is, is investing in that model uh, taking up a big chunk of Finland's um, economy, GDP? Um, I don't have the the numbers on GDP, but I do know that they that they are also saving money because homelessness is expensive. And I do oh. have some numbers if I can quickly think of them. Um, they have actually evaluated this, and they save more money than they spend by through this investment because, because they're solving the problem. They're solving the problem. And homelessness costs money. So it's easy for us to think sitting here in the US that, well, doing nothing doesn't cost anything, but that's not true. And there are studies here in the US that show that doing nothing is actually very costly because you're spending money when people are, you allow people to be homeless. First of all, their health deteriorates. It's, you know, physical health, mental health, everything deteriorates. People can acquire mental illness or acquire substance abuse addiction just by being homeless. And, you know, they don't, people tend not to have health insurance and end up in the ER. Things progress and they end up in the emergency room for basic health care, which will become a crisis. That's expensive. Extremely um, expensive. Extremely expensive. People, uh, cities spend money on police because they enact these laws that criminalize people for being in public. That costs money. So between healthcare costs, emergency room, police, this is all, um, we're spending a lot of money on homelessness without solving the problem. And because we're not solving the problem, the problem continues and it gets worse. And then that is becomes even more expensive. So Finland is actually saving money by solving the problem. So I think, and there are other models um, of social housing and you know Austria has a model of social housing. So, I think the basic idea, and there are groups here in the US working on this, and the basic idea is to acknowledge that everybody needs a home, everybody needs a place to live, and that we as a country have to invest in making that a reality. We have to, we have to recognize housing as a basic human right, and that is increasingly um, being talked about in public policy circles. Um, use, you know, I've been talking about this for a long time and advocates have been. At first, we, we would be laughed at, but now it's being taken seriously. Um, when we talk about housing as a basic human right, it seems like this would be a whole new law act. It, this, is, this is much different in scope and than the 1987 law, which is sort of a emergency response. This is no longer just a response. This is a whole new paradigm shift that right. housing. Okay. So exactly. ha have any political movements started towards this? Yes. Yes. So, you know, there is, there's been rhetorical movement, for example, the Biden administration, President Biden did say when he came into office, housing should be a right and not a privilege. Um, he was one of, um, there were, I think, four presidential um, candidates during that election who made this statement of housing as a human right. Has he, he, has he done anything about it? 
Well, he proposed, remember, Build Back Better, the ill-fated uh, Yes, proposal. yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, he did propose expanding the housing voucher program so that everybody who was eligible for it would get it. And yeah, yeah. that was torpedoed. But, you know, I think there have been, there are efforts at the local level. Right now, there's an effort in California to amend the state constitution oh, to, wow. include, to, to include the right to housing. Um, and there are groups working at the local level to promote um, social housing. So Seattle, for example, just adopted um, legislation. It was by ballot initiative that um, creates a, 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 an entity, a, a city agency to be a, a developer of social housing. So that's important. I mean, these are small steps. They're not going to by themselves solve the national problem, but this is putting us on a path in that direction. And I think that that's exciting. Professor Foscarinas, I'm going to ask you a question that is going to, I'm very nervous about asking this question because it's going to sound silly, but you hear it, so I want to ask it. Um, okay. you, you know, you talked about, uh, we're going back to housing first, and you said it's evidence-based that this works. Uh, in, in, in many circles, especially more conservative circles, whether it's on TV, I don't want to name any TV channels, uh, or, or even friends, you hear people saying housing doesn't work because homeless people wander off, they don't come back. Uh, I have no evidence about this. I'm just telling you sort of just, you hear this from time to time. Is this just hodgepodge? You're saying this is evidence-based that it works. This is evidence-based that it works. Yes. Yeah, okay. The people in housing stay in housing and, you know, they their homelessness is solved. I mean, there will always be exceptions to everything, but, you know, the evidence is that the overwhelming, the vast majority of people who go into housing as part of housing first stay and, remain housed and i want so, to emphasize here that when you say housing we're distinguishing this from shelters yes okay this is permanent housing permanent okay. affordable housing and it doesn't when i talk about a right to housing i don't mean everybody gets a housing for free you know people can pay you know many people have some income either through work or through, say, disability benefits, and can pay some proportion of their income for rent. But the, the housing has to be affordable, has to be affordable so that someone who's very poor can live there. Can live there. Um, in the minute we have left of our conversation, I just wanted to ask you about the National Homelessness Law Center, which you founded. Um, love to learn a little bit about it. So the organization uses the power of the law to end and prevent homelessness. And the idea is law is a powerful tool and um, you can use law to, you can make new laws, you can enforce laws that are, that already exist. And the idea of the organization is to work in partnership with people who experience homelessness to advocate for solutions, to advocate for housing as a human right, and um, you know to advance that struggle. It, the, the organization partners with many groups around the country, like the um, local level groups that I talked about, and also brings together a lot of volunteer lawyers who donate their time and, and resources and services. Is this, is this, when you say law, are we going back to the criminalization of homelessness or are there various different types of things for yeah. people being kicked out of their apartments or evictions? Well, there, there are different things. Yeah. I mean, there are many different things. There's issues involving homeless kids and their right to go to school. Um, oh, wow. Domestic violence survivors. Why would that even be an issue? Of course they have a right to go to school. This is an well, issue. Yes, that was an issue addressed in this early 1987 law that was a significant issue. Um, 
Yeah, that's that 1987 law said that if you're a homeless child, you have a right to go to school. And there's been this is something that I I and others have litigated because, yeah, it's uh, it's not always been complied with. Uh, I'm that. I, I I wouldn't have thought that 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 would ever be an issue. In fact, you would have thought it would be the other way around. You would want to take in uh, homeless children, and, and right. uh, wow, okay. Um, um, Professor Foscarinas, if you wanted our audience to remember just one point about homelessness in America after everything we talked about, what would that point be? Homelessness can be solved. We need to acknowledge that housing is a basic human night, right? It's a basic human need and it has to be um, recognized and treated as a basic human right. That's how we end homelessness. Yeah. Uh, Professor Foscarinas, thank you so much for educating me and our listeners. And to our listeners, if you know of any history that could provide more perspective from the past on this subject, please share it with us and tell us what's your perspective. Thank you so very much. Thank you. My pleasure.